everybody. This is our official start to day three of uh, a child-friendly community day. My name is Stephanie Schuler, and I'm one of the helpers to Richard and an amazing team of speakers and supporters of the conference. So I'd like to welcome you all. And uh, we were just speaking right now, Olga and Thomas and Bruno and some of the people on the line, Marsha, uh, we were talking about recess and kind of the in-between spaces in self-directed learning. Um, the spaces that aren't necessarily in the school or in the class um, and uh, how, um, we, you know, we, we are focused on what the children do in, in, in self-directed learning environments, but, uh, you know, what is it that the facilitators, teachers and mentors are doing at those times as well, which we don't often talk about, you know, as a group. I personally, I love the chats that we have on these conferences and other calls before the start of the official calls and in between in the uh, coffee spaces, I like those in between chats and they're often recorded on our, on our, uh, for our purposes, they're, they ha happen, the, the recording keeps on going, but those conversations are often the most valuable, the unplanned ones that just flow. Yeah. I agree. So um, I was given the opportunity by Richard to present some of my own uh, democratic self-learning initiatives that I'm associated with. Um, and I would like to um, acknowledge, you know, that we've been exploring ideas that prioritize children and their well-being. Uh, in particular, I would like to highlight the Maui Aloha Project, an eco-village initiative in Maui, Hawaii, that is founded upon the principles of democratic living, learning, and healing. Uh, the Maui Aloha Project is an emanation of my desire to merge experiences and lessons from diverse communities to create better social return for youth, seniors, and persons with learning differences. In my current doctoral thesis research at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, OISE, at the University of Toronto in Canada. I've been exploring families' experiences with learning disabilities and impacts on self-esteem. That research has evolved into the following question. How can we move forward in redesigning systems that are often punitive and co-create new learning environments where all children can flourish? The Maui Aloha Project is reimagining intergenerational communities focused on inclusive social designs, supporting innate abilities, interests, and multiliteracies in the pursuit of thriving individuals, thriving communities, and a thriving planet. The Maui Aloha Project hopes to be a blueprint for rural and urban environments, engaging in permaculture and aquaculture utilizing green building materials and methodologies and harnessing holistic development of the mind, body, and spirit. Daily opportunities for play, dance, music, art, mindful practices, meaningful connections with nature, animals, land, and water engagement and therapies. Each of these areas, which are unfortunately often pulled from conventional school curricula and the school day, the Maui Aloha Project will be a community hub where children and community members can curate their endeavors via courses, work trade, apprentice opportunities, participation in food sustenance activities of the community through farming, gardening, dining, and hospitality, have group workshops, weekend retreats, or live in community, and much more. The Maui Aloha Project includes permaculture farming, a wellness center, and a water sanctuary offering various healing modalities and supports, a new era based on valuing the freedom to self-direct our learning according to our natural curiosities towards wellness and the transformation and raising of human consciousness. In partnership with the University of Toronto and the University of Hawaii, we strive to address societal inequities by co-creating decolonized systems, celebrating diversity, honoring the wisdoms and identities of local and indigenous cultures, employing ancient and modern technologies and su supporting sustainable well-being, our desired social return. 
I will put into the uh, chat today a uh, link to the Maui Aloha project and also a participation link for any of you who might be interested in um, trying to con construct uh, new um, community opportunities, not just for schools, but for living opportunities uh, uh, and learning opportunities. And uh, uh, I'll also put my email in the chat for you to contact me if you want to discuss this any further. And with that, I uh, thank you for letting me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, my project, the Maui Aloha project. And I'm honored today to welcome this morning, uh, Bella Vasquez from Houston, Texas, and, uh, and Yaakov Hecht, who will begin our morning with a sofa chat uh, and I know that Bella has a number of uh, agenda items that she would like to chat with um, Yaakov. Um, Bella lives in Houston, Texas, as I said, and she's involved in many endeavors from co-founding Easy Tutors, a, a response during COVID-19 to providing to children uh, that pr provide children free virtual tutoring to co-founding Action in Africa, the Houston chapter that promotes community sustainability for the Nakuwadi village in Uganda and more. Bella enjoys mountain biking with her grandpa, painting with her mother and charity walks with her dogs. Bella likes to code, create robots and has recently taken an interest to learning Chinese from fellow students at school. We appreciate Yaakov being with us here again today as we continue our conversations from this weekend. I myself has vi have visited one of Yaakov's democratic schools in Hod HaSharon last year as our Maui Aloha Project Eco Village team explored some of the world's leading intentional democratic eco villages. We are grateful to Yaakov, the founder of the first school in the world to be called the Democratic School and for all of his continued influence in the world of democratic education. And with that, I give the floor and the microphone and the airspace to Bella and Yaakov. Thank you. All right, good morning. I just want to say like this past few days have actually made me want to become a teacher. I don't know why, it's just, I feel like I could actually make a difference the way you are speaking about it. But I don't know if Yakov has anything, but I have like a lot of topics that we could probably talk about for hours, but just let me know. You're welcome, Bella. <laughs> okay, so like the first thing I wanted to talk about, which was kind of touched on in the past, couple of days was like the appeal of learning and the appeal of going to school. Yes, and the connection between learning and going to school. Mm -hmm. And what you think it's connect? The appeal like of going to school. Like why do kids not want to go to school? So like I go to a, I've been in public school my whole life. And it's really common. Nobody wants to go to school because it's boring and they're teaching us more, not how to think, but what to think. And I think that's like the main reason why nobody, like going to school is not appealing anymore. So. I, I think it's a bold side to, to the idea of schooling at all. For one area, if someone was telling me now, Yaakov, you have two years. Don't do nothing. Don't go to a place that call a school and learn what you want to prepare you to the third year. Wow, wow. I will take it. Someone, someone here will, uh, everyone that take, I will give you now Three, uh, two day, two years, not working. I will pay you a salary and you can learn what you want. Who will take this uh, suggestion? Do like this in your end. Richard, you don't take it. Uh, you take it. Linda, you take it? Oh, okay. So. Most of the people take it, but 
if I will tell you the same story, but I tell you, you go now two years and you need to be only in one room, or if you want 10 rooms, you cannot move from this room and you do exactly what I tell you to do. Uh, I think most of us doesn't do it. So it's, it's the meaning what it's the process of schooling. If it's a process that uh, give energy to a, a good platform to every student, a child in the world to develop himself, uh, I think it's a great idea schooling. Uh, if it's a, it's a process that prepare me to do what strong people tell me to do, it's become very dangerous uh, place. Uh, it's prepare me to do what people above me tell me to do. This is really dangerous. So the situation now is, I think it's, it's a real question, not only in the field of democratic education, it's a real question around everywhere in the education today. How I build a process that give a freedom to people to develop and find them their uniqueness. Meanwhile, they want to keep that we will feel part of our community and our nationality. And these two things, it's not clear and it's not easy. Uh, uh, but I, I feel that the, the question is on the table now. And to me, it's, it's quite good that the question on the table, I, because when the uh, question come, also different solution begin to going up. So Bella, you think like me that if I gave you two years to develop yourself, uh, you will take it? Outside of school? Of course. I feel like in my public education is, I'm not going to doubt it, but really what we feel like we're being valued as is numbers. Like we get, we're pressured to show up to school because the money gets paid to the school for us showing up and we get paid for taking standardized tests and we get and the they're like you need to take it because our school gets funding and that's how we have all these nice things so i feel like the value has really been stripped from the students to down to numbers and how much our money goes and into if you can choose what what you want to do what you've done in this case what you will done well, what I want to do with, I'd actually like to stay local and maybe run for, a, I don't know, maybe a politician spot, maybe become something that will actually help my community because right now I, I know uh, Stephanie mentioned my easy tutors program and it's so hard to find students who are willing to help without the incentive of volunteer hours or credit. So what we did, I have like four other students who are actually interested in helping the community and we spent like 40 plus hours like interviewing tutors, setting up our website, making everything perfect just so we could provide resources that our district wasn't giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I will take from the Stephanie what she say about your uh, project. I, I like the atmosphere of uh, mixed ages. Uh, and it's not only mixed, uh, uh, sorry, it's not only mixed ages, it's mixed generation. And I think we can build a community with mixed generation. And that can be, I think, a very strong solution to the future. And I also take it from what uh, Olga say when I get inside the discussion and she say, that uh, we cannot do the same democratic school that we done 30 years ago today. Need some things was changes. We are we are living in a very dramatic change today. So I think 
all the concept of the old democratic school need to change. And uh, we need to bring new ideas to the field of democratic education, not only to the field of democratic education, also to the field of democracy at all. I think we, we, we need to think, I, I'm sure that the democracy will uh, reinvent uh, itself uh, in, the, in this time. And uh, we can see it's now all over the world, people think, how we give more power to the people, how we give more power to people to bring their ideas. Uh, what's, it's, it's cannot be that the voting today, it's exactly like it was 100 years ago. Uh, we can do something that uh, work day by day. So I think when we will make uh, living at school as a mixed generation, that we support one another, it can be something very, take us to the front of also new democracy at all. Well, I think also that um, originally schooling and the way conventional schooling is set up around the world, colonialized schooling, it was never supposed to be interesting. It was never supposed to be something that children, that anybody cared if children were engaging in. It was supposed to be, uh, you know, a, a doctrine of this is what we want you to learn because we want to build a workforce, you know, a factory workforce. But now, um, not just now, people uh, through the years and through the ages have said exactly what you're saying, Bella. I'm not engaging with the material. It's not personally relevant to me. It's boring. It's not interesting. The way that it happens, we're sitting all day, we're being spoken to and lectured to, and it's artificial. It's not at all natural. Like uh, you know, you're a all of our natural endeavors, whether within a home or any kind of scenario, we're just with one age group. Like you know, like Jakob is pointing out, we're discarding our, our seniors and we're not mixing together and um, uh, being excited about you know the various things that excites us or or, or even the various things that excites our teachers or our school leaders. You know, those are those are side conversations. Those are for the evenings. Those are for the weekends. It isn't really an authentic um, process of of um, uh, of engagement, it's it's not personal, and uh, I, I agree. You know, until we um, you, you everything that we talk about in this conference, you know, and engage in community and and all of the wealth of experience and wisdom that we all have through the ages, sharing it with each other in a natural way. Yeah, it, it might be less boring. I will say that the first step when I think about the change in education is not coming to my head to give freedom to students. I think the first uh, thing that come to my head is giving freedom to the educators. Uh, and I think if we, if educators cannot make a choice and they can bring what they believe. It's impossible that educators that you, uh, the people tell them what to do like a slaves and they need to do something that they cannot understand why they do it. They will give freedom to the student. So I think before we going to bring uh, freedom to the student, we need to give something like a professor in university have a, a academic freedom. I think every educator need to have educating freedom. And, uh, and, and I think it's a very, very important step uh, to, to change the education at, in the world at all. Yeah, that's something that I see a lot in my classroom, even over the computer, we have a set amount of time to learn a specific topic. And even if the class hasn't grasped it, 
we won't reteach the topic unless the class fails the test. So we're asking for more time to learn a certain topic, but the teacher can't go anywhere with it because it's mandated by the district a certain amount of time. And the class isn't learning anything, but what happens is we move on. Nobody understands what's going on. We fail the test. And then the teacher gets a bad uh, grade for their um, teacher evaluation. And then they're like, what's going on? But what's happening is it's not form for the students. They're teaching for the teacher We're just to teach. They're not teaching for the students to actually learn anything. So yeah, I think some wiggle room or freedom for the teachers to set up how they want their classroom and their teaching methods would be really effective. Yeah. To, to give someone to t uh, the freedom to, to, to choose is to believe that he's human being. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give him the, the freedom to choose, you take him, you, you don't trust him, you don't trust him. And then you tell him, you, you are a teacher. It cannot go. To, I think Finland is something place very unique. They really make the teacher as the hero of their society, and they give and they and they trust them to decide what to do totally with the curriculum and the inside the class. And this is something very very important. Yeah, and I've even seen teachers get reprimanded for actually going out of the box and going away from what the district is mandating to actually teach the kids what they want and how they want it and how they've um, offered their advice to teach it. And they get reprimanded and they're, they step away from that and then they go back strictly to teaching what the district is mandating. So I just think it's funny, like the teachers are getting reprimanded for actually teaching the kids. Yeah, I, I will tell you a, a secret. I think I never talk about this. Uh, it's a something that in our school in Hadera, when I was a principal of Hadera Democratic School, all the time people ask me, from where you bring so, so good teachers? And from where I bring it, I only tell everyone that come to teach in our school that he do what he believe. He doesn't need to do what I tell him to do. So I give him a freedom to choose what to do, to learn how to, uh, to learn and teach and how to do it. So I give him, a, so a lot of people with dreams about education begin to come to my school. Also, if they doesn't know nothing about democratic education, but they have a dream. So I, I open my school to educators that have a dream. So I have a waiting list of teachers from all over the world that want to come to teach in my, a school in Hadera, and, they, and that's, I think, the secret of education. If you give a freedom to the teacher, you can find unbelievable teacher. But if you build a teacher, you build on a kind of teacher that they need to do exactly what you tell them to do, all the time you will have people that they cannot understand the, the idea of democratic. They, 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 they really feel obligation and, and survival. And they will all the time survive. And, uh, and, they, I didn't, and that's, I think, something very important. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to say something, a few words here? Sure, Olga. Uh, hello, Jakob. Uh, for my opinion, it is great what you were saying about, but the aim at the governmental level, the aim of education is much more important than freedom of the teachers. Because if at the end of schooling, students pass I will say directly stupid exams and tests, a lot of them. So even free teachers will have to teach to pass these exams, not to follow teacher's dream or student's dream. And uh, I see it a lot. 
and you are lucky, Jakob. I uh, had my research about Israel, and when you started with your project, and now you have rather soft uh, situation at the end of schooling. And I don't know how could we pass this situation. I, I, Olga, I, will, I don't know if I can say this story in English, but I will try. Because I, all the time when I'm talking, I'm thinking about if I can say it in English. Me uh, too. So, yeah, Me so too. we are in the same situation. So I will tell you something that happened really. It's uh, the Greenpeace in London, the fight against the uh, uh, companies that take the skin from the uh, fox. I don't know how it's called, the skin of the fox? Yes, fur, fur. 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 And, uh, and they come to the, some of this factory in the night and they open all the, all the, how do you call it? Where this, the fox is inside. Mm -hmm. The box, they open all the box of the uh, uh, fox and free them. Mm -hmm. So in the morning when the people come to the factory, they found all the box of the fox is open and all the fox inside the box. <laughs> and, and, uh, and this is something very important to understand. And that's all the time in my mind. When I see students teach a student that want exams, that's what they know. I was the same. A lot of time I, I was sure that it's impossible to, le to learn without exams. And so I understand that this is the, something that we need to develop in ourselves. And to begin to do it, you need to give more and more freedom to the adults. But it will take time. It will take a lot of time. I, I, it was a big, dis one time that I was the advisor of one of our Minister of Education, she said to me, Jacob, you really believe that we can trust the, the principal of the schools? And I said to her, sure, it's not I believe, you must. If you don't trust the principal of the school, so close all the school. What, you send people to spire on the, the principal? You must. And yes, I told her, they will cheat you. But that will be some of them. And then count how many of them cheating you. And you can found that less and less and less. How you trust more, then they less cheating you. And, and that's something very, very important. I think, and this is the complicated situation of uh, democracy, uh, schooling at all. It's the story of trust. Because if you trust, people be, feel that you are trust them and they become trans, trustable. I don't know how to say it. They, they be feel that they, they really, people can trust them. But if you don't trust them, oh, okay, you don't trust me, you will see. Don't, don't look on me and I will do exactly what you plan. That's exactly what happened in exams when we keep the teachers that the student don't uh, cheat. Okay, now I, I will be better than you, than you and I will cheat you. So it's, it's, this is the so difficult situation. It's a difficult, but it's possible. What I, 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 I don't have research that say that all the people will go out of the box, but we can see that slowly, small group of people begin to go out of the box and that's give me power. And I'm sure that we will not finish this work in my lifetime. So Bella will continue. Oh yeah, can I just say something about the standardized yeah. tests? Yeah, that's true. A lot of teachers are just teaching to pass the test and that's not really what it should be about. I think it should really be about learning because 
how many tests are you going to take once you get out of school? Then you're really going to be faced with actual issues. And I think the tests are false validators. People who might not have really good test taking skills, but are know the material front and backwards could do worse than somebody who barely knows the material and is a really good test taker. So I just think, yeah, teaching for standardized tests and tests in general are just, it's not effective. I, I want to tell you something very uh, happy. I don't know how to call it. It's very good. I feel strongly, strongly that your kids doesn't have, they, they will know, doesn't know what is exam. You will tell them that it was exam, but I think exam will disappear in these days. And I tell you from how, why I'm so um, optimistic. I, I optimistic because I see the new economy and I work a lot, I, I, people that meet me, I, I work a lot with startup companies all over the Israel and uh, in some other places. And it's, to me, it's very interesting how they choose their, their workers. So you have a startup company in the new innovation things, how you choose your workers. So less and less uh, companies, especially startup companies, uh, tech uh, looking about a certificate. In Israel, very few, and it's disappeared. But also they don't make a traditional test. They, what they are doing, they choose, they check three things. One is what you are learning today. Your, what you're learning today. It's not important that five years ago you learned something. What you to learn today? Second is your ability to learn in real time. For example, they give a situation and now you have open internet, telephone, go come in four hours, do talk with who you want, bring solution. And, the, and, the, and the, the, the third very important things that they are choose, uh, checking is your ability to work as a team your ability to make a partnership and work together. This is three things that it's very strong today in the innovative companies. And I think it's, especially now after the coronavirus, I feel the old traditional organization will collapse. They cannot come back. They need to be new one. And, uh, when they will be new organization, it's change the what what they are looking of new workers, and the new workers will change schools. So I really, really believe that the future, you we will have the museum of schools that uh, Bella, you and me will go there maybe to the museum of schools, and we say, oh, they were sitting and making tests. But I really, really, really feel that in the next 10 years, 20 years, that will disappear. I, I think it will take 20 years, but it will disappear from this moment. And 20 years from now, it's not will exist. Yeah, I agree. And I think, yeah, like I said before, standardized testing and testing in general is just stripping away the individual and just putting a number and a grade and saying that's how good you are. Like that grade is how good you are. And I think this whole idea of like a child friendly community will form those democratic schools because once you have a child friendly community, you're valuing the youth and the elder, you're valuing everybody and they're gonna stop, I guess, putting numbers on these kids and not valuing them as much and actually thinking about how they're teaching them and what they're teaching them and how it's going to translate once they leave school. So I'll just talk about my Action in Africa thing because that's something that really ties in. So Action in Africa is an international nonprofit that I co-founded for the Houston community. 
I founded a chapter for the Houston community and what they do in Nakawada, Uganda is they have a school for kids and they they also offer like medical outreach and women programs who that offer educational resources. So what they're doing is they're like forming a sense of community and they really what their their classrooms are super small so they're they're focusing on each individual kid and I think that's one of the main reasons that drove me towards that nonprofit and made it attractive for me because they're valuing all the people and it it helps that it's a small community so they have this sense of unity within the community and it really fosters the growth and self-sustainability once that nonprofit leaves the community. So Bella, one question. How mm-hmm. old you are? If I can 16. ask. 16. 16. Mm-hmm. It's fasc- fascinating what you, you are doing. And uh, today it's a very special day to do because we uh, build a new innovative center in China and I get all the time pictures and uh, we are, all the innovation uh, center will be about the 70 goals of the United Nation. You, you know the 70 goals? No? no. It's, it's, but it's, it's very, no. uh, but the idea is to make a network of children around the world that support one another. And I will glad to bring you to, to bring your story to, to the center in China. Please do. So be in, be in touch with me. Mm-hmm. Can I have your email? Did you put it in the chat? I will put it. Okay. That was there's, um, some discussion in the, the chat. And I'm wondering if we, we might take a look at, at what Grace Workman uh, Rucky said. Um, she says, uh, I agree with With Yakov, the idea of trusting principals and teachers seems amazingly revolutionary in the best possible way. I'm, I'm wondering if we might pursue that a little bit, if uh, Grace would like to, to speak to that. And, and also, Bella, just your own thoughts about, about that and the teacher's role in, in how they need to advocate for themselves, perhaps. Yeah, see, I'm... like I've witnessed teacher unions and things like that and I, I think somebody else mentioned that and really there's a lot of pushback where I live like you can form a teacher union but you're either going to get fired or you're going to get reprimanded in some way and really suppressed um, but I think teachers should stand up for themselves I think they need to advocate for how they want to run their classroom and how they think it's best for their students And I said, yeah, I've seen, I have some really great teachers, but um, they can't do anything because they'll get in trouble. And I, and I think they're valuing like coming to school and seeing these students, because I have some really great teachers. I'm going to shout them out for that. They are really great, but they're put in a box with what they can do with their classroom. I think somebody had a question. Oh, well, Richard. You put a great thing in the chat box, which is, is there a way to get the teachers union on board with the idea of teachers should have more freedom? That would be uh, brilliant if we could get them onto that. <laughs> make it, and we should make it like it's their idea. <laughs> Then I think that could uh, go a long way toward, towards what Jakob was talking about. Jakob, do you think that's at all possible? I think this uh, shirts can be great. Uh, I will say that I don't know if you know the book it exists uh, a very successful book today it's called flip the system mm. and uh, it's about uh, the situation of the teacher in the world and uh, the idea is uh, that now they are in the bottom of the pyramid and uh, the all the school all the book it's about how to make a shift and make them in the top and uh, And uh, Norway, uh, no Norway, uh, Netherlands adapt this uh, book and now the, the, uh, the education uh, department of education in the Netherlands try to do to try to really make 
this book happened in Netherlands. But I don't know how to write it. Flip the system. It's easy. On the comment about unions, as uh, Sydney said in response to um, Richard's question about how unions are there to uphold work conditions and fair wages and not necessarily learners conditions. So I'm just wondering what people have to say about that because yeah, here our unions talk about hours of instruction, not learner well-being. They see though, when uh, here and certainly in Ontario, when there's um, any kind of an election, that unions put up big signs about you know teachers or about students, and it's all about the kids and cuts are hurting kids. They they you know we know that they actually exist to protect the teachers, like that is the foundational purpose. But their rhetoric is all around how they're there to support kids and, you know, giving, having the right resources to support kids. So perhaps we can engage them in their rhetoric. <laughs> yeah, because working conditions, like working conditions would be better if they put children at the center. It'd be better for them and for the kids. Mm. Yes, when, when you say better for them, Marcia, that... That really uh, resonates with me because mm. it seems to me that we're, we're not doing a proper job of, of conveying that democratic teachers uh, are likely to enjoy their job far more than the job that they're trying to do as, uh, as the managers of children. And, and if we can start to convey to them that, that the, the health of, of a teacher, their own well-being, mental health, is dependent on them being treated with the same democratic values as we're talking about for the kids, then maybe from, from the inside, they can start to, to mount a new mentality among the, the union leaders, or at least elect in new union leaders that will pursue that direction. Because uh, I, I think the failure is, is on our part right now that we're not conveying well enough that uh, teaching can be that most honorable of professions that some people say it can be. Uh, we've allowed it to slip away from being the most honorable of professions. And uh, if we can recreate the vision of, of what it is to really enjoy teaching, then uh, we get things situated right and the unions can still be there to make sure that, that the powerful don't um, don't abuse people like all unions were originally intended to do. What worries me about flip the system approaches that I see in most um, municipal efforts to give teachers more power is that there's not much discussion of the children. It's all about the administrators and the teachers looking to see who's on top. And I don't think enough focus goes for the children. So what you suggest, let's make them down and maybe how it's how you can think that we give a freedom to children if we don't give it to the teacher. But if you look on the book, they make a lot of research and they show it's very clear that how much you give freedom to the teacher, they give more to, uh, freedom to the, uh, to the student. Also, I think the old organization of working of the teacher, they are like all the work organization and they need to change. And that's not connect. That's, they need to connect. But if you want to bring freedom, we cannot jump on the teachers. We cannot jump and give freedom to the student. They agree, they agree. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 can I tell you a crazy story that happened to me? I, I, I've had some very interesting experiences with unions. Hi, Bella. I hope it's okay to jump in here. Um, thank one, you of my, one of my experiences, and thank you for saying what you said in the chat yesterday about my story of my class, um, because one day, um, my class had a maths teacher who shouted at them all the time. 
And the interesting effect of shouting at a class, you probably know this, is they get noisier and noisier. It, it really doesn't work. And my class had this technique for shutting themselves up. If five kids put their hands up, they'd have a three or four, it changed, it varied, five minutes quiet time. And this was a class rule that they enforced on themselves. And they got fed up with this math teacher shouting at them because they didn't actually want to be a noisy class. So they had a quiet time in the math teacher's class. Now I told them that this law was only to be used in my classes, not to be used in other teachers' classes, but they did it anyway. And they made themselves quiet. They had a quiet time. And then the teacher shouted at them, why have you gone quiet? And none of them would actually tell the teacher because it was a quiet time and they weren't supposed to speak. So in fact, they were just really making it clear to the teacher that if, they, if she couldn't keep them interested, they'd control themselves. Anyway, the teacher complained to the union that I was undermining the discipline of her class and I was reprimanded by the union. In fact, they threatened to throw me out of the union um, if I went on behaving like this. So I had a bit of an argument with my class. I said, for God's sake, you're just making trouble for me here. And they were really quite sorry about it. But that was one of my experiences with the union. And then when I thought I was going to get fired for using these methods, um, the head teacher actually got me into his office one day and he said, Derry, I really like what you're doing. I thought he was going to fire me, but in fact, he wanted to give me a pay rise. And when, when the union heard that I was going to get a pay my, rise in my first year of teaching, they produced some rule that actually said, head teachers were not allowed to give young teachers a pay rise in their first year. So my experience of unions, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't all that favorable. And once we, when, when we moved from having democracy in one class to having a school council, which wasn't just a student's council, in a way it was quite good. Teachers, caretakers, janitors, grounds people, cleaners, Dinner, dinner staff, everyone was on this school council. And uh, the kids put an item on the agenda saying, why, do, why are teachers late for lessons or they're not allowed into the rooms? And another group of kids put on the agenda, why does it take so long to get our coursework graded and marked? We have to wait six weeks to get it back. And by the time we get it back, we've forgotten what it was all about. And these items were on the agenda for a school council. And before them, right at the start of the meeting, a guy who was a top union man in the school stood up and said, I insist that these items are removed from the agenda. They're, they're allowing students to talk about the behavior of teachers. And uh, I had a bit of a bad moment. The head teacher had allowed these items on the agenda and I didn't know whether I should allow them to be discussed or not. So I, had, I asked for a vote. Who's in favor of taking these items off the agenda? And of course, the students actually backed off at that point. And I think it was partly they didn't want to make trouble for me. So they took the items off the agenda and uh, I, didn't, I wasn't disciplined by the union. But my experience of being trying to be a free teacher got me into trouble with the unions. But I have to say, I think they've changed a bit because there's a group of young people who wanted to be here today called Teach the Future. Unfortunately, they're not here because they've got a big meeting in Scotland. Um, the, the, their campaigning issue is that schools should teach about climate change. And they think that students should create the curriculum um, for climate change. And the nice thing about the union, I'm still a member of the union, I never left. And one of the nice ways in which it's changed, it's now supporting school strikes. It's now supporting the kids demanding a better curriculum for climate change. And the, there was an article in the last edition of my union paper where teachers actually admitted 
that the students knew more about climate change than they did and maybe the students should be given uh, much more of a say in the curriculum around climate change. So I have to say the unions have changed. But my own experience is, but looking back on it, it was funny. Though it gave me some sleepless nights at the time. Sorry to go on a bit. No, there it's great. Send me the link to, to all of us, the link of, of this article. I will share with you also a story that I never tell no one, I think, until now. In broad, in Israel, we know this story. Uh, you know, when I built my school, I was dictatorship because I was the founder of the school and I wanted that will be a, a state school. So I become the principal. No one chose me. The, the Minister of Education chose me, but no one from the school chose me. Uh, and I was a principal for 10 years and then I left school. When I left school, it was a big discussion. How we choose the, uh, pres uh, the next uh, principal? And I, I, I my imagination was limited. So I say, okay, let's bring student to the group that decide about the next principal. So it will be like a, any school in the world, in Israel, but with student. The, the organization was against us so much. And it's, they say, you are crazy. Student will choose the principal. It's impossible. And in the end, we make the decision. Two students will be in this um, decision. But that was the beginning because that was 23 years from now. And then, the, minister, the, the other principal was left and we need to choose again. Step by step, we decide that we make election in our, in our school every four years. Every four years we have election to principal and everyone can be a candidate and everyone choose, everyone have a vote. That was like a, red, red flag to all the organiz teacher organization in Israel. It was people, parents, students will choose the principal. And I don't know, and this is, I think that the, the time is changed. It's begin step by step. Today, the, all the principal, all the, the last uh, principal that is now the principal of the school, all the parents, I was a parent in this time when he began. Now I'm, my student finished to be, my uh, children finished to be a student, but we vote everyone. And that's something very, very interesting. Situation between the discussion between organi working organization and I think people that believe in ideas, I think people that believe in ideas for a long term, they are win, but it's a long term. Could I ask Bella? Do you have a? Do you have any? Uh, are you consulted when new staff are appointed to the, to your school, Bella? Do the students have any say in who in which teachers will come to the school? Yeah, that was it from the first year. Yeah, definitely not. But I can say that our school has a decision making committee composed of staff and administration. And they teach, um, students are allowed to go into those committees. They're not allowed to say or make any decisions. They're not allowed to vote on anything. They're allowed to come and listen on what they're, the decisions they're making for our school. But then I didn't even know about this until an upper district administrator told me, like our school doesn't broadcast that our students can come and hear what the decisions that they're making. I didn't even know this existed and I'm in my third year of high school. But no, we don't get consulted at all. I'd like to jump in here now. Um, and I want, want to keep this conversation going. Uh, and in respect of Jakob's time, I don't know if he's able to stay past this hour. 
but uh, nevertheless, we would like to thank you, Yakov, uh, um, for engaging with Bella and engaging with all of us in, in these important discussions. Um, this morning, you really talked about the future of education, what you see as a, as a leader and a forerunner in the change that we, that we want to see, that we all agree with. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, here we addressed in this conversation, not only um, content being relevant and not being boring for children um, and self-directed learning, but we also talked about um, teachers, you know, the, their agenda, their, you know, how they're strapped. And we talked about, um, you know, the constraints that they have within the system. And we talked about administration and we talked about the unions. Um, so many rich conversations uh, we look forward to at a time when there aren't, when we can say, oh, we used to have tests all the time and, and the kids don't even know, won't know what we're talking about. What is that? What does that mean? How wonderful will that be? Because it causes so much pressure, so much pressure uh, and also takes away from sleep, um, you know, anxiety, depression, all kinds of things because of, you know, uh, learning for the test and, uh, you know, content not necessarily being meaningful and uh, also getting your marks by so much later that you don't even remember what the test was about. You can even build on the foundations. Yaakov, we always uh, appreciate you. We're so grateful for you uh, for being uh, the center spoke in a world movement that's been going on for some time. And I think that all of us on this call uh, really feel the momentum of what you've started, what you continue to support and harness and, and share with all of us. We're really grateful for your time. If you can stay on, we would I, love you to be, yeah. I, I want to say something to the end, and it's not connected, but it's about democratic education. It's a, I don't know if you know, but it's for a long time, it's not was a IDEC in North America. Uh, it's like uh, the people from Europe and uh, Asia was connected and begin to play between, and we begin to play between us. And I think it's a very, and I think one of the big goal of IDEC was to time to time to move to another content. So everyone here from your Canada, United States, South America also for a long time, it's not, uh, was the uh, uh, IDEC. If you take the responsible and uh, moving the IDEC, uh, I think now we are talking about 2023. Uh, uh, to North America, I think it's very, very important because we want to feel close to you. So thank you of that you invite me and it was great to be with you. Thank you, Yaakov. If you can stay with us, please do. Thank you I, so I'm much. sorry, but I need to go to, but thank you. Okay. Um, a general a question that um, I'm facing right now in Sri Lanka, uh, where we are in the pros in the thick and thick of beginning a de first democratic school in Sri Lanka. So we've been um, talking with the um, education psychologist who's actually um, been working quite a lot in uh, the in the USA as well. Um, has some exposure into the charter schools, whatnot, um, all that. Um, in the conversations, though, she does also work with the Minister of Education in Sri Lanka as a consultant. So, in conversation, um, while she agrees with the, you know, the principles of self-directed learning, democratic school framing framework and all that we keep hearing uh, but you need to have a basic skill set we need to have co uh, you need to have some institutional structure you need to have um, core knowledge components you need to know like what children should what age group competencies we should build in and all that so I'm like um, get frustrated and worried sometimes that um, you know, when, when an education psychologist says this, you know, that you need to have an institutional structure, 
uh, whatever said and done, this is, we need to operate in the culture which is used to schooling. And here we are trying to, you know, um, do something completely out of the ordinary. So we, 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 we attend to, you know, there's this push to get into a system when we're trying to break out of the system. And the people who are supposedly advocating is also saying, oh, but you need a bit of structure. So this is really frustrating for us. And I just wanted to open up the conversation to you guys here to see whether this has happened before and then what have you done about it and just, just comment on this situation. I can share a little bit on that um, oh. because I worked in a public school and ran a self-directed program. So sometimes what you have to do to those people because you're not going to change their mind you just kind of use the passive smile and nod and agree with what they're saying, but then continue to do what you do. And don't worry about too much about those people um, because my experience is they usually don't follow up and check on what's going on. They just give you structures and advice. And um, if you agree with them, they go away. So I don't know if that's effective. That's maybe not a long-term solution. Yeah, I think I think practical. I think that's practical. Yes, I think uh, it's it's when you um, sort of talk to them, they need to give the opinions, and their opinions are already framed. I guess so. When I suppose we just take it with a pinch of salt and move on. That's good. Yeah, and there's some buzzwords you can use that people, education people, kind of relate to. And so I used to talk about project-based learning, experiential learning, um, child-centered. Those are terms that people can kind of understand. And um, it wasn't accurate. That's not really what we were doing. But I mean, in a way, you could say we were doing project-based learning because we allowed younger people to follow their own interests. So I guess you could say it was project-based learning, but there are some terms that people that are kind of in the education world can relate to. And um, so I would use a lot of those terms. 